first Sunday of Advent, and at this time I'd like to ask Pat Blakesley to come forward. Uh, we will first bless the Advent wreath, and then we will ask her to uh, do the reading and actually light the first candle. So if you have the song sheet, if you could follow along, and my acolytes, if you'd like to come on over here. Our help is in the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. And let our cry you. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, bountiful in your goodness and your mercy, who does desire the happiness of all your creatures, but above all the happiness of all humanity, we humbly ask you to bless and to sanctify this Advent wreath, so that it may serve us as a symbol of light overcoming darkness and truth overcoming deceit. Grant thereby that our faith may be strengthened and our hearts enkindled with the fire of your love, so that in serving you zealously, perseveringly, and faithfully, we may one day behold you in all of eternity, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O Holy Lord, Father Almighty, everlasting God, the creator of all things, who is the light, on this day we ask your blessings to be with us throughout this Advent season. We ask you to bless and to sanctify these sources of life, and to hear our prayers as you did hear the earnest prayers of your people throughout the ages. We ask that these candles may be to us the symbol of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is the true light. Grant that as these flames will glow brightly before us, changing darkness to light, that we too may possess that same light of Christ within our hearts that will shine before all people. This we ask through the same of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And at this time, I ask Pat to light the first of the candles of our Advent wreath. And I 
do want to mention that since we uh, did bless the wreath and light the first candle and bless these, uh, we'll be beginning now with the preparatory prayers of the Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. I will go into the altar of God. Our help is the name of the Lord. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, let us confess our sins to God and prepare ourselves that may worthily participate in this holy sacrifice. Today, the church obviously looks different than last week. Uh, the flowers are removed, the purple is added, the purple is the color of penance, and this is the, to symbolize that we are to prepare ourselves by removing sin from our lives and all things that would detract uh, and take us away from God uh, so that we, can be, that we can become the spiritual major for Christ on Christmas. Also, the Gloria will be removed from Mass. That is because that's the song of the angels that was uh, announcing the birth of the child Savior to the Bethlehem shepherds. And uh, since we're anticipating that birth, we take that out of the Mass as well. So you'll notice that change as well. And so the uh, light of uh, the Advent candle, each week there's a little bit more light symbolizing that the light of Christ is increasing in our world. And then on Christmas, on uh, well, actually Christmas Eve, we actually light the Christ candle at the center of that wreath. And we take that light and share it with everybody in church that night for the first singing during, in a candlelit church of uh, the first hymns of the Christmas season. And so there's an awful lot of symbolism going on that only really becomes meaningful if we participate in this in a continuing and increasing uh, devotion and, and to get closer and closer to Jesus through all of these Advent messages. Uh, that's why this week we'll also have the Advent Marian Mass. Obviously, the mother of Jesus plays a huge role in uh, our preparation for his birth, and so we'll honor Mary on Wednesday. But all of these things help us to better understand uh, the mystery that is Christmas. So as we gather today, which is the very first day of the brand new liturgical year, also the very first day of the Advent season, I ask you to please make a private examination of your conscience. May we now recite the Confidior together. I confess, Almighty God, one of the Holy Trinity, who knows the innermost secrets of my heart, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed, by my fault, by my fault, by my own great fault. In your presence, O oh God, I earnestly repent of all my wrong deeds, and am heartily sorry that I have offended you. Most merciful Father, have mercy on me, forgive me, and pardon me my sin. I resolve to amend my life, improve and sanctify, that I may become worthy to serve you faithfully all the days of my life. I beseech the blessed Son of Mary, all the saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray to the Lord our God for me. May Almighty God have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to life everlasting. Amen. May the Almighty and merciful Lord grant us pardon, absolution, and the remission of our sins. Amen. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and by his authority vested in me, I absolve you from your sins, in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh God, you will again renew us. And your <laughs> Show us, O Lord, your mercy. And grant us salvation. O Lord, hear our prayer. And let our heart come to you. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Take away from us our iniquities, we beseech you, O Lord, that pure hearts may enter into the tabernacle of the Holy of Holies, through Christ our Lord. Amen. I wait for you, O Lord, I lift up my soul to my God. In you I trust. <coughs> not let me be disgraced, and not let my enemies float over me. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. Son Jesus Christ promised to return to us in the fullness of time. As we hear his word, prepare us for his coming, 
We ask this through the same Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. The lesson prescribed by the Church for this morning's Holy Mass is taken from the Old Testament book of the prophet Isaiah. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah in Jerusalem, in the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it Many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up on the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord of Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come let us walk in the light of the Lord. Here ends the lesson prescribed by the church for this morning's Holy Mass. Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. Therefore, let us not the but let us say a word and so forth. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia. God rules over the nations, God sits upon his holy throne. Alleluia, alleluia. Almighty and eternal God, cleanse the lips of the prophet Isaiah with a burning coal. Cleanse my heart and my lips for your gracious mercy that I may worthy proclaim your holy gospel through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord be my heart and on my lips, that I may worthy proclaim his holy gospel. Amen. The Lord be with you. A reading from the holy gospel according to St. Matthew. That day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. For as it was in the days of Noah, so will be at the coming of the Son of Man. In those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day that Noah entered the ark. They did not know until the flood came and carried them all away. So it will also be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be out in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, one will be left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know which day the Lord, will, the Lord will come. But be sure of this, if the master of the house had known the hour of the night when the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and not let his house be broken into. So too, you must also be prepared, for at an hour you do not expect, the Son of Man will return. By the words of this holy gospel, they are sin.
Thanksgiving was rather exceptional. It was the 150th anniversary of the first official National Thanksgiving Day. Long been celebrated up here in New England, which kind of makes sense, but in 1863, President Lincoln decreed it to be a national holiday during some of the darkest days of the Civil War. It brought just a little bit more light into our divided nation. And Thanksgiving Day's Thespian Centennial Anniversary was also the beginning of Hanukkah, the Jewish festival of light. The last time that happened was 1888, but far more extraordinary is that it won't happen again for almost 80,000 years. And I was, if, as if 80,000 years wasn't monumental enough, on Thanksgiving Day itself, something else special happened. Comet Ison decided to pass by the sun after traveling from the darkest regions of the solar system were just sat out there quietly for four and a half billion years. It began a spectacular ride toward the light of the sun to arrive for a Thanksgiving visit after one million year ride. From four and a half billion years ago to 80,000 years into the future, this 150th anniversary of Thanksgiving Day was to say the least memorable. And when special occurrences like this pop up on the calendar, causing us to think of such huge swaths of time, and also of a particularly special moment in time, we can begin, and only begin, to appreciate just a little bit better the idea, the idea of God's time, and then God's idea that he would leave that timelessness and enter in at one particular moment into our world in Jesus of Nazareth. God dwells in the eternal, it is said. And eternity is free of time. And we have no way whatsoever of picturing what this means, so I won't even bother to try to explain eternity. There is no time there. So God is an older, God is a younger. It's not like he has to wait for time to pass. It's not like it's now and the future and past. There's just no time for God. We simply cannot imagine. So I won't even try. But God left that eternity and came into time in Jesus. And this means he reached out of that timelessness to touch us, to be with us. His whole nature changed when he became a part of creation, when he was limited by the clock and the calendar. And how do you say that idea of God in Hebrew? The Jewish people of long ago called it Emmanuel, which is the name of God so frequently heard during Advent. We begin to appreciate the wonder of Emmanuel, God with us. Not God somewhere transcended up in the heavens, but God with us here. When we try to imagine simultaneously four and a half billion years into the past, 80,000 years into the future, and then one particular period of 24 hours on Thanksgiving Day. This remarkable coincidence gives us just a little bit of an inkling of what Advent is trying to impress upon us as we prepare to celebrate Emmanuel, God with us of timelessness and time coming together, of the unspeakable mystery of God becoming one of us 2,000 years ago, giving up all of the glories of heaven above him to be us. And we have a lot of work to do to try to appreciate that, because so much of our attention at this time of year is Santa and not Emmanuel. We've been talking about Thanksgiving Day, so let me start there. This is a wholesome holiday. It's about appreciating what we have and offering thanks for simple treasures like food on the table, a safe uh, place to gather, and also family and friends to gather with. But unless you're like the Detroit Lions who play every Thanksgiving day, unless you're a supermarket, unless you're an airline in one of the busiest travel days of the year, it's not a real big moneymaker. So what are we bombarded with all those days leading up to Thanksgiving and then Thanksgiving Day itself? It's all of those commercials, commercial after commercial, telling us that Black Friday, you don't have to wait until 1 or 2 or 3 in the morning, that sales would start at 8 p.m. on Thanksgiving Day. And that forced people to show up at work because they would have been fired otherwise. This entices people to line up early outside of the stores, and in the process, Thanksgiving is rushed through, and in some cases, even forgotten. Being thankful for what we have and for those around us is an old-fashioned virtue that is abandoned simply for what money can buy. That's why Advent is going to be so hard for us, because even something like Thanksgiving is thrown to the side because we've let Santa replace Emmanuel. And Advent suffers from the same thing. As one small example, 
At the rectory, we receive a catalog from a chocolate company. And Sharon pointed out to me that they used to sell a very nice advent calendar. On each day of the season, you'd open it up the door, and you get just a little bit step closer to Christmas. Now this is now this is how that same calendar is advertised in your catalog. It says in the catalog, open up one of the 25 doors on each of the 24 days before Christmas. Behind each door is a gold foil dark horse chocolates treasure. On the 25th day, Christmas morning, you will find the pony you've always wished for. Advent is gone. It's not even an Advent calendar anymore. The baby Jesus is gone. He doesn't count anymore. Now Christmas is about getting the pony you always wished for. And we allow this to happen. This message is nothing new. It's not surprising to any of us here. It's being preached in every church, everywhere. It's been preached for years. But so much money is spent trying to convince us that Black Friday, Small Business Saturday, Cyber Monday are all the reasons for the season that even us, the people of faith, we have to start wondering, why bother at all with that? Why bother waiting and preparing when Christmas is only a credit card away? We don't have to do anything to change our souls. Just buy me stuff and Christmas will be fine. And I wish the church also wouldn't make it even more difficult to concentrate on Advent. We muddied the waters of Advent by not only talking about the coming of that holy child Jesus on Christmas, which everyone in the church is thinking about during Advent, but we also throw in the triumphant coming back of Jesus at the very end of time, and that was today's gospel. I know why the church has to do this, even if it is confusing. The prophecies about the coming of the Messiah, they're filled with stories of conquest. They're filled with images of power and even heaven on earth. Nations, it says, will beat their swords into plowshow chair, and neither shall they learn war anymore. This didn't happen with the birth of Jesus, and it still hasn't happened 2,000 years later. So all of those prophecies about what happens when the Messiah comes, they have not come true yet. So we try to protect the prophecies. We postpone all of those victory stories until his second advent when he comes back at the end of time. <clears throat> and I think the reason for this double whammy that makes everything so muddy is that it gets us off the hook. It's not about God. It's about us. Advent is about preparing now because when Jesus brought God into the world, he showed us what we could be. He revealed that God gave up being like God to be extraordinarily ordinary. And the flip side of that is that the birth of Jesus, if God can give up being God to become us, we can give up being the usual us to become like God. You know, God can't force us to not learn more anymore, but we can choose to be a more peaceable people. God can't force us to be thankful for what and who we have in our lives, but we can choose to be thankful people. Maybe just maybe the prophets of Advent were set in motion by Jesus' is coming to the world, but maybe, just maybe, they need to be completed by us. Maybe they're fulfilled when we decide to walk in the light of the Lord. God can't push us into the light, but we can decide to walk in the light. Maybe, just maybe, that's the power of Emmanuel. God with us. With God at our side and Jesus of Nazareth, maybe we can do these things. So let us pray that during Advent, we prepare to be more godly. Put the credit card back in the wallet, back in the pocket, spend some time with God, spend some time here, and let us try to be more godly. Then Jesus will have done his part, we will have done ours, and together, maybe, just maybe, we'll be able to make this a far better world. And these things we pray in that child's name. Amen. The name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty Lord, on this first Sunday of the Advent season, the first Sunday of a brand new church year, we offer our prayers for the strength and comfort of Anne and Dan Cronin and the continued health and strength of their baby, Elizabeth, is offered by their family and the new Carson. We offer in loving memory, um, in loving memory of the Morosky, Orlowski, Capito family, who passed in the month of December, Teddy Morosky, Vinnie Capito, 
Betty and Peter Orlowski and Beatrice Morosky is offered by the Orlowski and Perpito family. We offer our prayers for Steve Marvis, a high school classmate and good friend of Don and Ellen Morosky, who passed away on Friday suddenly and unexpectedly, and his prayers being offered by Don and Ellen Morosky. We offer our prayers uh, for Catherine Barrett, who passed away 60 years ago on December 5th, is offered by her granddaughter, Teresa Belisle. We offer our prayers for Patty Rodman Mark, a friend since grade school who passed away suddenly and unexpectedly on Friday. Again, is offered by the Helen, um, Ellen Sprosky and the Palmer family. We offer our prayers for Francis Murray, a high school classmate under hospice care in Florida. is offered by Helen Sprosky. We offer our prayers for Michael Goodheim. Uh, today is the 16th anniversary of his death. It's offered by his wife, Barbara Goodheim. We offer our prayers for the strength and health of Hugh Hubbard. It's offered by the Hubbard family. We offer our prayers for Dr. Jay Sullivan and Susan Derchak, friends of mine who are battling cancer. We continue to pray for Marshall Aaronstan as we, he also battles cancer. It's offered by his friends here at Holy Name. We continue to pray also for John Savage as he battles cancer, is offered by Joe and Peg Pushchuk. And lastly, we also offer prayers for my cousin, Judy O'Brien, who was also recently diagnosed with cancer. We ask the Lord to hear all of these prayers. We ask that you hear the private prayers that we bring before your altar. We ask that you bless us to your gathering. We ask that you be with those who are parish who are unable to do this here today, and those who are parish who have chosen not to be with us here today. And we pray for the safe journey of all of those who are traveling this Thanksgiving Day weekend. For all these things together, Lord, we pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven.
Amen. Receive, O Holy Trinity, this offer, which you make to you in memory of the Passion, Resurrection, and Ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, in honor of Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints, that it may be available to their honor and to our salvation. May they intercede for us in heaven, whose memory we celebrate on earth, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be accepted to God, the Father Almighty. May the Lord receive your sacrifice from your hands. Amen. Merciful Father, you taught us in your holy word that the night is exhausted and the day is approaching. May we who offer you this oblation of the Mass awaken to live as children of the day and not of the night. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God. Throughout all ages of ages, Amen. the Lord be with you. Abide in you, and my words abide in you. 
pastor whenever you wish, and it will be done for you. Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. For their sakes I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth, that they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me, I in them, and you in me, that they may become completely one. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. After these other words of the heart of in prayer and with holy fervor, our Savior took into his holy and venerable hands, took bread into his holy and venerable hands, and having lifted his eyes to heaven, to you, O God, his almighty heart, giving thanks to you, he blessed you, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, All of you take and eat of this, for this is my body. Taking also the sex of chalice which was holy and venerable hands, again giving thanks to you, he blessed you and gave it to his disciples, saying, All of you take and drink of this, for this is the chalice of my blood, and the new and eternal testament, the mystery of faith, which for you and for many shall be shed for forgiveness of sins. As often as you shall do these things, do them in remembrance of me.
Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Lord, I am not worthy. When you say the word, my soul shall be healed. Lord, I am not worthy.